right. <clears throat> good evening. Let me check my volume. I think I'm good. Good evening. Good evening. Praise God. Um, this is the Living Water live stream Bible study. I am Bernardine Wormley Daniels, and I will be leading you in class tonight. Praise God. As you, good evening, Adrian. As you come into the room, say hello so I know that you are out there. I can say something to you. Praise the Lord. Will it? I know we, we missed a week last week. That's the only thing about, um, that's my hesitancy in um, when I cancel class is because then it's hard to get your momentum back. Especially when it's a nice day like it is today. People be outside doing all kinds of things. But I see people are checking in. They're coming in on the view. They're just not um, saying anything in the chat room. So just say hello when you come in so I can greet you and know what region you are viewing from. Good evening, Cheryl. Good evening, Kathy from over the waters in Canada. Praise God. Share the link. Share the notes. Let people know we're on. Good evening, Carol from Ontario. Praise God. Okay, my Canadian friends. If you guys, I don't know if you guys were on the stream I just did with Jacintha with Harvest Outreach the other night. If you were, I'm going to be teaching um, those same notes. If you missed it, then hang in there. We're going to do something interesting tonight. Pam, from also from Ontario. Man, the, the Canadians are checking in. Where's all my American friends, you know? Where's the greater metro Detroit area and Ann Arbor and all those peeps? Where are the Americans? <laughs> all my Canadian friends are in the room. Linda, hello. Praise God. Share the link. Share the notes. Let people know that we are here. I was eating some nuts, which I shouldn't have been doing before we came on the air because nuts just get stuck everywhere in your, in your gums and your mouth everywhere. Praise God. It would be good to... Oh, there, that was a lot of information. Yeah, it was. The notes are um, on my page. Oh, my cousin Mary and my Aunt Mary are in the room. So we can start. I won't be waiting on nobody else. My Aunt Mary is watching. So we're going to get started. Praise God. The notes are on my Facebook page. There's a link um, that'll take you to Dropbox. Um, hello, Gwendolyn. Um, it'll take you to Dropbox. And there you can um, download the notes, okay? Listen, um, the month of May, Logos Book Club was supposed to be reading this book. You guys should be finished by now. My book club was reading The Chosen. I have called you by name. So watch for a date coming up this month in June where we will get together somewhere. Uh, probably after church or on a weekend, like in a park or at a restaurant, and we will eat and we will talk about the book. Um, if you have not downloaded the chosen app that allows you to view season one and the first five episodes of season two, you are missing a phenomenal experience. This is one of, well, it's not one of, this is the best dramatization of biblical times, um, keying in on the historical stuff that was going on with the disciples and the historical Christ 
Jesus, you will love it. Don't jump into season two. You'll have to binge watch season one, okay? If you have not seen it, you need to download the app now. You can even get season the entirety of season, season one on a DVD, okay? But this is the book that corresponds to season one. And um, we were reading it for my book club. So watch for uh, something on my page saying, hey, let's get together to talk about the book. Okay. Praise God. I know some of y'all forgot. It's like, oh, I, I did not get that book. I was not reading that. Oh my God. I missed that. <laughs> if that was you. Okay. Let's see who we got. Um, Ruth. Good evening, Ruth. Yes, I made it home through all the crazy drivers. I had a meeting up in Lansing today. So I had to make it home from there. Good evening, Donna. Praise God. Good to see you in the room. Listen, guys, if you have been watching my Facebook page, I have scheduled a retreat coming up at St. Francis Retreat Center in Lansing, Michigan. It is a beautiful, the grounds are absolutely beautiful. The gardens, the, there are, let's see, 24, I think it's saying 24 different gardens and, and features on the grounds where people can um, get away, like have some private time outside with the Lord. The retreat is scheduled for July the 16th through the 18th. So the weather should be very warm. Um, I invite you to join me. It's at this retreat center. The price is great because you are only being charged for your room and your meals. I am not adding a charge for my time, for materials, um, none of that. The only cost you'll be paying for is your private room and your meals. And that cost totals $165, $165. Um, I only reserved 21 spots and 16 of them are gone. So I got five spots left. If you want to go on the retreat, you need to register now, okay? Make a deposit if you don't have the whole 165, save your space. Now I can adjust my contract, um, but I'm not gonna do that if it's not necessary, okay? Um, because I just went to Lansing today and made a deposit on my contract with them for 21 people. So you would pay Soterios Ministries. They will not deal with you at all. We cover all the expenses after you pay us. So the retreat is at St. Francis. This is up in the Lansing area in an area called DeWitt, DeWitt, Michigan. The grounds are beautiful. I was just there today. And um, um, the retreat is called the Ancient Pathways. And it's all about encountering the heart of God through prayer. It's been over a year ago that I was actually in worship at Shekinah. And as we were worshiping, the Holy Spirit just began to speak to my heart. And I heard the words, they just looped in my soul, the ancient pathways. And the Spirit, and so I grabbed my journal, I wrote it down. The Lord began to speak to me, you know, in that moment. He said, do you know what the most ancient pathway is? And of course, when the Lord asks you, if you know something, just say, no, you don't know because you usually don't know, okay? And he, but you got to come to the retreat to find out what that is. So um, he began to talk to me about the pathways, the diff that there are a, a variety of ways that ancient peoples um, prayed and encountered the Lord. And um, so it's a time away. It's a time for you and the Lord. I will simply be your guide. 
I will be um, teaching some material and then guiding you into the actual activation of those different forms of prayer. We will be looking at Lectio Divina, um, the, ex um, the Examine, looking at St. Ignatius, the Examine, um, let's see, Lectio Divina, the Examine, um, Breath Prayers, um, um, the Daily Offices and Beads, uh, Praying with, be what's that all about? Praying with, with, how did the ancient church do that? Because they did for centuries, okay? <laughs> So we're going to look at, what were they doing? We're going to look at the um, Sursum Corda, which really is an intro into communion. Um, oh, um, Lectio Divina, Visio Divina, all kinds of things. You need to come praying in the spirit, praying in other tongues. Um, uh, it, it's going to be an interesting time in the presence of the Lord. All you would need to bring is your Bible and a journal and your weary soul. And uh, we're going to encounter the Holy Spirit. It's something the Lord told me to over a year ago. And I had been dragging my feet. And finally, the Lord said, set a date, set a date, teach my people how to pray. So that's what that's all about. You've seen some posts on my Facebook page. And, and it's not just for women, I should say. It's for whoever wants to come. The, the building that we will be staying in, you will have a private room. Um, it's kind of like a dormitory room where your room is private, but it connects to the other room through the bathroom. So you'll share the bathroom and the shower, but your room is private, okay? And um, so, of course, if there are men, we would have to pair the men together. We wouldn't pair a, a man connecting his bathroom stuff with a, with a, a woman. We wouldn't do that. Okay. So um, sign up. I got 21 spaces reserved. Made the deposit today. 16 of them are gone. Okay. Uh, for my Canadian friends, I am so sorry <laughs> that we can't do this with you, but when they open that border, um, maybe I'll come over and um, with um, Jim and Jacinta and uh, we'll figure out a way to do it over um, in Canada, um, okay? So it's a Friday evening, You and I'll have to confirm the arrival time. I know it's after three. I think you can check in your room at five. Dinner, I believe, is at 6.30. So you would have time to just relax on the grounds um, for a little while, we would have our first meal together and then our first couple of sessions um, Friday night. And then we would have all day Saturday together. And then Sunday morning, the retreat ends at 12 noon. We have to check out because there's another group coming in um, later that day behind us. So it's called the Ancient Pathways. It's, it's um, the Lord. Um, I, first, I thought he was giving me a book. And immediately the Holy Spirit said, I don't want it to be a book. I want it to be an encounter. So God is up to something. I would plan to encounter him in tremendous ways. And um, that's that. It's on my page. And if you have any questions or you need, you can always message me uh, that type of thing. $165. That just pays for your room for two nights and meals for three days, okay? I think that is a bargain. You can barely get a hotel room one night for, for that price. So, um, and no charge for my time, okay? Or the material. Um, just come, praise God. God wants to bless you. All right, so grab your notes. Grab your notes, and we're gonna jump in. We're gonna talk about be of no reputation. This is another word that the Lord gave me in this season, um, in this year, in the earlier part of this year. Um, I am sure this is a word from the Lord. I'm absolutely sure. I taught this at our leadership seminar that we did at Shekinah. Just taught it with, um, oh, I taught it with um, Jennifer Waddell, her ministry, her Zoom Bible study group. I taught it with my Canadian friends um, through um, Harvest Outreach just on Friday. And now I'm going to do this on my own live stream. It is a word from the Lord, okay? So you want to get those notes. 
and you're going to want to share them <laughs> with your friends, okay? So let's pray, and then we're going to jump right in. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this time in this place with these, your people. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do and all that you are. Lord, be with us tonight as we endeavor to study your word, to hear your voice, to know you more intimately, to walk in your footsteps, to live according to the tenets and precepts and principles of the word of God. Bless us, O oh God, as we break open the bread of life and drink deep from rivers of living water. We pray in the authority of the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All righty. All right. So if you have a Bible, open it to Philippians 2, um, verses 1 through 11. Philippians the second chapter, there we go, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. And let's see what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us tonight, okay? So now listen, I'm, I'm going to read it to you in the ESV um, because it kind of makes sense. And then I'm going to read it to you in the King James because that's when the Holy Spirit spoke it to me. That's how I heard it, okay, in the King James. I think the Lord is so interesting how he does that because sometimes the Holy Spirit will speak a word to me and it'll be in um, the ESV or some other translation and then sometimes it'll be in the King James. But there's something that he that definitely he wanted me to see and so I know it's also a word for um, the body. So it reads as follows. So if there is any encouragement in Christ any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Now, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. Okay, so this is him speaking to the church, to the, to, to the people that, that he leads, you know, and that he's an apostle for. So he says, um, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Just gonna let that linger in the air for a second or two. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that's Philippians 2 verses 1 through 11 in the ESV. But now here's the verse that rang in my spirit, these few words in verse 7 from the King James Version. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Okay, now, uh, before we um, get into um, the, the bulk of the message, I, I need to give you this preface. Because I, um, as, you, as you hear this and as we go through this, you need to know that everybody has a lens 
or a filter through which they see and they experience and they process things. Everybody has one. Everybody. Matter of fact, the other day I was at Home Depot and I was buying a filter to replace the, the filter in my, um, my um, heating and cooling system in the house because the, those have those filters in them, you have to change them. Well, mine has this digital thing. So the digital thing will tell you when the filter needs to be replaced because it gets full of dirt and stuff that clogs the filter so it's not able to breathe and release either the heat or the air. Are you guys following me? Okay, so you have a, yeah, my furnace. You have a filter, okay? I have a filter. Now let me preface what I'm going to say by telling you the stuff that's in my filter. Because <laughs> okay? this is my filter. You got one. I'm going to tell you about mine. Okay. So I am an African-American female raised, born and raised in the inner city of Detroit. That gives me a certain lens through which I see things. How many of you understand that? Okay. So I'm an African-American female born like in the 60s, you know, inner city Detroit. Also in my filter, I am a very well-educated African-American female. I went to Cass Technical High School, played three varsity sports, finished with seven varsity letters and three different sports when I was in high school. All of that colors my lens, okay? I went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, go blue, the Wesley Theological Seminary in um, um, Washington, D.C., and then um, Detroit International School of Ministry in the Detroit area. So, you know, if I'm honest, I mean, I would have to say there have been seasons in my life where I was very impressed with my resume. Okay. That's in my filter. Very impressed. I worked hard. You know, I'm a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. I was a reservist when I was an undergraduate student. All that's in my filter. Inner, also, inner city black church religious experience. That's in my filter. I mean, I, I was raised in churches, for instance, just to show you some of the differences in, in our filters and our lenses in urban African-American churches where I was raised, for instance, people didn't call their pastors by their first name. Hey, Bob, how you doing? No, you didn't walk in and call the pastor by their first name. That's in my filter. Okay. Pastors, because of a lot of cultural reason back in the day, you know, it has really shifted today, but then, you know, pastors were held in very high regard. They were honored. They were respected. Okay. Are you guys with me? Okay. That's in my filter. <clears throat> now, as I um, served in the Methodist church, I served in different cultural contexts and in different cultural settings, people have different filters. So when I served in predominantly white churches, white people, Called their pastor by their first name. Hey, Bob, how you doing? You know, that kind of thing. That took a little getting used to because that was not my experience. You guys with me? Okay. Um, for instance, like at where the church where I serve um, today, um, there are lots of people who call Apostle Barbara Yoder um, Barbara, Pastor Barbara or Apostle Barbara. I never call her by her first name. She probably wouldn't mind, but that's just not in my filter. Okay. So that you guys understand. Okay. So in the secular world, in personal life, in the military, and in the church as a leader, because I am a well-educated African-American female with all of the stuff in my filter, filter I, have pers I have experienced or felt um, what I perceived as innumerable incidents of disrespect and dishonor and disregard. And even what, what to me was disenfranchisement where I felt like I was denied rights and privileges and we don't have time to go into all the ugly stories, okay? That's just the stuff that's in my filter. Now you have a filter too and you have stuff in yours. But this, you know, I've preached in churches where I was not allowed to stand in the pulpit because I was a female, where I had to preach from the floor, 
you know, they put a lectern on the floor, but they wouldn't let me go up into the pulpit area and preach because they didn't believe that women were supposed to be doing that kind of thing. You know, I, when we were in Nigeria, I, I was, we were in a place where I was not allowed to pray or prophesy without covering my head. Okay. Um, I've been in church. I was doing some ministry down in Alabama. I remember I was at a church where the women's group brought me in, but the pastor did not want me to lay hands on anybody to pray or to minister prophetically to anybody. So they missed out on that anointing that I do carry. Okay. So um, all of that stuff gets in your filter. When I served in the United Methodist Church, I was sent to small dying churches that could barely afford to pay me according to my education and experience. I was involved in projects where I'm in a project with other, with other colleagues, males, white males, who were paid literally double what I was being paid to do the same work. So I've got stuff in my filter, okay? That's the background. I have, I have to give you the background to what I'm getting ready to say. So the list goes on. So essentially, my filter, your filter, is full of life experiences that make me hypersensitive to certain things. Your, your filter causes you to be hypersensitive to things that I might not even think about, just like mine causes me to be sensitive to things that you might not think about, okay? Um, for instance, I remember I had a friend in seminary and I used to, um, who was a really good friend of mine, white female, and we're both in ministry and we were dealing with, we had this workshop on racism at the seminary. And I was trying to tell her about what I experienced as an African-American female and she just, she couldn't connect. So because we, the seminary was in the wealthy part of town, there was a clothing store up the street. I said, okay, let's go to the store. When we walk in, they're going to ask you, they're going to say to you, hi, welcome to so-and-so, may I help you? And you're going to say, no, 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 I'm just here browsing. And they're going to say, okay, and they're going to let you browse. I'm going to come in about two minutes behind you. They're going to say the same thing to me. Hi, welcome to so-and-so, may I help you? I'm going to say, no, I'm just here to browse. They're going to let you browse, but they're going to follow me all over the store. Okay. You know, and she couldn't, she could not connect with that. So we went down, did it. And they did just what I told her they were going to do. Cause that's, that's a part of my experience as a black person in America. Okay. So that my, my point in saying that to you is to let you know that we get stuff in our filter. So what's in your filter. Okay. So now, uh, um, my filter and my life experience makes me hypersensitive to what feels like disrespect or dishonor or disregard or disenfranchisement, okay? And so I had, there was a, there, um, um, let's look at the text, okay? In Philippians 2, that passage in um, verse number uh, 6 and 7, it talks about how um, the, the ESV says he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. The King James, which is how I heard it, said he made himself of no reputation. So I heard the Holy Spirit say that to me. Um, he said, be of no reputation. And I was wrestling in prayer at the time with an incident that had occurred, I won't go into all of the details, um, because I have met with the person and we have talked about it. Um, yes, Linda, yes, yeah, see, I understand what you, yeah, you you understand what I'm saying. Um, I've, I've met with the person that was involved in this incident and we have talked about it and tried to work through it. But at the time the incident occurred, I was really upset. Okay, there was something that happened that I perceived as sexism, racism, and blatant disregard and disrespect, period. And I was pissed, if I could say that, if I could use that word. I was really upset. I mean, for several days. And so as I was, and I had wrestled in prayer with it, um, the incident, because it had set me off. 
and it fueled um, feelings of dishonor and frustration. And, and what it does is it, it touches the wound of all of the systemic racism or, or as a woman of um, uh, misogyny or you know, sexism that you experience, particularly as a woman in ministry, okay? So the incident really set me off. I was upset about it. And I spent the next couple of days, the day of the incident, and then the next, so about three days, just mulling over the event in my head, in my heart, and I'm telling God about it. Do you ever do that? I mean, do, do you ever do that? Do you ever have something that just gets in you? And so you're telling God about it and you're, you're, you're just pleading your case. You know, I'm telling God, I wanted God to deal with them. You know, <laughs> have you ever been there? Somebody say, man, if, if you, if you've ever been there. And so particularly, and then in the midst of it all, I ran across this verse in Psalm 55 and verses 16 through 17. And here's what it says. It says, but I call upon God and the Lord will save me evening and morning. And at noon, I utter my complaint and moan and he will hear my voice. Look, that word. So I looked up that word. That word complaint is the Hebrew word shiach. It means to ponder, to converse with oneself, to, com to commune, to complain, to muse, which also can be translated as pray. Now that blessed my soul because in other words, the psalmist is saying, I call upon God. I'm looking for the Lord to help me evening and morning and noon. In other words, all day long, every time I thought about it, I shiached which is the type of prayer, but it's the type of prayer where you are complaining. You are, you are talking to yourself. It means to converse with yourself. Come on. Am I the only one that talks to myself? I talk to myself all the time. Complaining, communing, and moan, that's the Hebrew word hama, which means to make a sound like a hum. Mm. Yeah, because you want to slap somebody. It means to be troubled, to growl, to cry aloud, rage. That blessed me that that's in the Psalms, that God knows that we have times when we feel like that. I put that in your notes. You're welcome. Praise God, you're welcome that I found that. And so you can, you can know that when you, when you get there, look at what it says. It says, and he will hear my voice. He will redeem me unharmed from the battle that I wage for many are arrayed against me. Cause that's how, that's how we, we, we feel, you know, that's how I was feeling on that particular day. And the Lord heard me. So the word tells me that I can bring these things to my father. I can bring them to the Lord. I can tell him how I feel for real. You might as well be honest. I can moan, groan, complain, share my heart, all the good, the bad, the ugly, and he will hear me. And he will redeem me. He, now, now listen, the redemption may not look like you thought it was going to look, okay? Because in my particular incident, I, you know, I, I was looking for justice. Lord, you need to do something, you know, you, you need to do something, okay? So um, here's the redemption that I received. You have to love the Lord. <clears throat> I love the Lord because, you know, he must look at us sometimes and just shake his head and go, oh, my God. Let me help. Let me help this sister. Okay, so here's the justice that I heard. I'm, I'm, I'm shiaking and hamaing. <laughs> shiaking hama. I, I'm doing the, what, what it says in Psalm 55. And these are the words that I heard. I was sitting in my prayer closet and I'm in there and I'm praying, you know, and I'm being super spiritual and very quietly, but ultra clearly, it just floated up in my heart. Be of no reputation. 
I was like, what? Be of no reputation. Now, I was immediately annoyed, okay? I knew it was the Lord, and I knew the words were in the Bible. I wasn't sure where, but I knew it was in Scripture, so my search began. So I Googled it, of course, <clears throat> and there it is <clears throat> in Philippians chapter 2, King James Version. So here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to know. When we approach scripture, I tell you all the time, this is a Jewish book, okay? And it's Hebraic in its roots. And your Messiah, your Savior, came as a Jewish rabbi, okay? So that ideology and how he deals with us is still there. So one of the things you need to know is that when a rabbi was trying to teach his disciple something, he would often give them a part of the text implying the entire passage and its context and content, okay? So he would feed you just a piece of the passage because the rabbi knew that you understood you were not to pull it out of context, but look at the, the whole context of what he was trying to show you. And Jesus did that all the time. That's why you'll have passages in the gospels where he'll say something that sounds simple to us and they want to drive him out of town or the religious leaders would get really upset because they understood that that little phrase he used implied the entire context in which it was found. He does it from the cross when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Psalm 22. It implies the entire context when he says from the cross, it is finished. That is the end of Psalm 22. It, it is like book hinges on a Psalm 22 is a messianic Psalm. So you have the religious people, the religious leaders that were witnessing the crucifixion understood that they had turned over their Messiah. He was implying that this Psalm was fulfilled in him on the cross. Okay, that's free. I won't even charge you for that. I just give you that for free just to show you what I'm saying. So when the Lord gave me these words, be of no reputation, he meant to lead me not only to the verse, but to the context that surrounded the passage. Okay. So it turns out that he was speaking to me specifically from Philippians 2 verse 7. So let's dig into this text and find out what treasure we will find that will restore our souls, <laughs> okay? What treasure will we find? One of the things you need to know is that Paul wrote um, this letter um, near the end of his Roman imprisonment, near the end of his um, imprisonment in AD 61 or 62. And of course, um, Paul was um, executed right around that time. So this is near the end of his ministry. There were, uh, there were three other prison epistles, um, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, you know, all of those books, when you read them, you have to understand that the stuff that he's saying to them about unity and about love and about forgiveness, all that stuff was written while he was in prison, being persecuted for the, for the faith, okay? that That's a tremendous witness and testimony. And, and none of us are in prison. We ain't being thrown in jail for saying Jesus is Lord. Not yet, but it's probably coming in America soon. <laughs> you know, America is sliding into the abyss as we speak. Okay, so Philippians is one of those books that has tremendous, several passages that um, many people quote, you know, they pull them out of context. Like, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. We've heard that. We've heard to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, many people are familiar with, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All of that's in Philippians. But 
the portrait of Jesus as a humble servant is at the core of Paul's teaching in this letter. If you open the book of Philippians, the heartbeat, boom, 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 the core of the teaching, the heartbeat of his letter is Jesus Christ as a humble servant, okay? So Paul's joy at, um, the, as he thought about the Philippian church, you know, is undeniable. He, he's excited, okay? <clears throat> but he took them directly um, to teaching them that a community of believers should live in harmony and in mutual humility. And as we do that, we are living like our Savior. <clears throat> now, a lot of churches, that's not the case. Um, for, it's difficult for some reason for believers to live in harmony and in mutual humility. Because we have this hierarchical mindset that is not the heart of God. Paul wrote um, that he poured out his life as an offering for the sake of Christ. And so um, Christ as a servant is the center of, of the, the book of Philippians. And so, you know, we, we all have um, much to be thankful for, you know, the pace and the pressures of life, family work, and sometimes the church, even though we have a lot to be thankful for, those things can squeeze the life and the joy out of us. You get out of, you leave your house, get in your car, and between your house and the supermarket, you run into all kinds of crazy people that just squeeze the, the, the joy, you know, out of your day as they drive crazy. Our filters that I talked about earlier, our dirty lenses, you know, cause us to be stressed out, frustrated, angry. Um, sometimes days are difficult to get through. We get desperate and people begin to um, um, comfort themselves with um, shopping or, or food or drugs or alcohol. People do all kinds of things, you know, to comfort themselves that doesn't align with scriptures. None of those things can bring lasting joy. But Paul knew um, that true joy, true contentment and peace comes only through humble faith in the saving work of Christ. When we join ourselves in harmony with him and with his followers together serving the name of Christ, that's where peace and true contentment, true contentment comes in. So true joy is loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then loving our neighbor as ourselves. That's what Jesus said. And so there's something about learning what it means to be of no reputation that serves to keep us from useless quarrels and divisions in our personal and corporate lives together in, the, in, in um, Christ. So the scripture, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So I'm very quickly going to go through some of these definitions and then we're going to put it back together and look at it. Okay. So let this mind, um, be in you. Mind is, um, the Greek word phroneo. And of course it means to have a sentiment or an opinion. So you, you, whatever Christ's opinion is on things, that's the opinion that's supposed to be in us. It means to be mentally disposed, to interest oneself in, to set the affection on, to have the same mind, to agree together. So you have to find out how Christ feels about a thing and you lock your mind in on that. Okay. You take that same posture. You, ad you adopt that same viewpoint. You side with him in public affairs, not a particular political party, but the kingdom, okay, let this mind be in you. Who being, that's the word huparko, we're going to look at that a little bit more in a minute. It means to exist or to live in the form of, that's the Greek word morphe, it means nature or form, hold on to that, 
That's going to make more sense in a minute. In the form of God, Theos, that's talking about the supreme de deity. This is the Godhead, the God, okay? Um, thought it not, that word thought is hegeomai. It means, but what's interesting about this particular word for think, it's the type of thought process that you have the authority to implement, okay? Um, so you, you to think, to have authority in that thought process. Um, and so you have influence, so your thought process has influence on others. Okay, so he thought it not robbery. Now that's a very interesting word. The King James uses the word robbery. Um, you know, the word is harpagmos. It means um, to seize or something to be held fast or retained. So I don't know that I would have translated that as robbery, but okay, that's, that's what the word means in the Greek. To be, that word enai, it means to exist. Equal is the word isos, equal in quantity or quality, but made himself of no reputation. Now, here's our key word, reputation, ekenosin, or kenoo, it means to make empty, to abase, to make of no reputation, to void, um, to, to lay aside equality with. So in other words, when Christ um, kenoo, when, when he did that, what he did was he emptied himself, he voided himself of equality with God. He the, everything about him that was God, he took it off and he, he like turned it off, flipped the switch and turned it off. You guys with me? Uh, you need to hold on to that. Okay. And then took upon him, which lambano means he laid a hole instead. And that word lambano, when you grab something, you grab it in order to use it. Okay. So he emptied himself of um, all the perks and benefits of being God. He hit the off switch and he took to himself the form, that's the word morphe, again, the nature and the form of a servant, doulos. That's a slave. That's the lowest position. That's giving up your will completely in service to another disregarding your own interests and was made in the likeness of men. So what's the message here? What was the Lord saying to me as I was ranting and raving about how I had been disrespected and <clears throat> that whole thing? Um, so let's, let's wrestle with the text a little bit more so we see if we can find the Holy Spirit's message. <clears throat> so I, I, here's what I do when I look at those definitions and, I, and I'm saying it to myself, with the definitions in mind, trying to understand it. Who being in the form or the nature of God, thought it not robbery, thought it not a, a thing or the nature of God. He didn't think that was something to be held on to so that he would be equal in quantity and quality with God. But he emptied himself. He, he, he took that off and made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself, in other words, of the benefits, the nature of being God. So in our faith, of course, we believe that Jesus is fully God and fully human, but he emptied himself of the God part while he was in earth and walked the earth as a man, okay? That, that's right there in, in the text. So, see, we like to look at scripture and say, well, Jesus did this, and Jesus did that because he was God. No, Jesus did some of the things he did because he walked in submitted faith, uh, intimate relationship with his father through the help of the Holy Spirit, just setting the example for you and I. So being in the form or nature of God, thought it not robbery, a thing to be retained or grasped or held on to, to be equal in quantity or quality with God, but made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself of the benefits, the nature, the perks 
of being God and took upon him the form or the nature of a slave and was made in the likeness of men. Okay. You guys still out there? <laughs> I hope you're still listening. So churches all over the world, recently we went through the um, Easter resurrection season and when we just went through Pentecost. And um, so, of course, Jesus, um, um, his birth, his life, his ministry, his betrayal, his scourging, death, burial, and triumphant resurrection, greatest series of miracles the world has ever seen. Because it is the culmination of God Almighty laying aside his glory and appearing on earth as a man. Now, you got to get that. Laying aside everything that, he, that, that was God or the glory of being God, the perks, and taking on the nature of a man. And not just a man, but a doulos man, okay? So that he might pay the price for our full redemption. So let's look at, let's look at it. Um, let's look at it again. Philippians 2 verses 6 and 7. Paul wrote, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. So I hear the Holy Spirit saying, be of no reputation. Paul begins by describing the pre-existence of Jesus before he came to earth when he says, who being in the form of God. That's the pre-existent Christ, almighty God, okay? The word being is the, um, remember, is the word huparko, which is a compound of the word hupo and arche. Hupo means from, arche means the first, original, or ancient. So it says, from the ancient of times and you know it, it it describes something that has always existed so by using this key word paul is trying to tell us that jesus eternally existed in eternity past jesus was okay he had no beginning he always existed in the godhead jesus is god so it also explains the statement when jesus said before abraham was I am, okay, one of the expressions that, that as God identified himself in the, in the Old Testament. So in Philippians 2 and verse 6, it could be translated, who eternally existing in the form of God. In other words, Jesus' human birth at Bethlehem was not his beginning. It was merely God stepping out of God and being clothed in it taking off the perks and power and the benefits and being clothed in the, in the likeness of man, okay? So it, his birth in Bethlehem was his manifestation in earth time, okay? It was a brief appearance compared to his eternal existence. 33 years is not even a nanosecond compared to eternity, okay? So Paul is telling us that Jesus always existed in the form or the morphe, the nature and the form of God. And so this word describes the outward form, his inward form, his pre-existence. If you saw him in his pre-existence, he looks like God, okay? He was not just a component of God or a symbol of God. He was and is a part of the Godhead, God. Okay, and as the eternal God himself, Jesus possessed the very shape and outward appearance of God, a form that includes great splendor and glory and power and a presence so strong that no flesh can endure it. So if you fast forward in your mind to the book of Revelation, you'll see um, John when he's caught up in the spirit on the day of the Lord and he sees the resurrected Christ in his glory, and he falls at his feet like a dead man <clears throat> because he sees him in his glory, okay? And so his pre-existent and his current existent glory <clears throat> and, and splendor, who can endure? If he manifests in that depth of glory, you will not be standing up going, hey, Jesus, what's going on? 
<laughs> I don't think so. Okay. God existed in glory more wonderful than the human mind can comprehend and more powerful than human flesh can endure. Yet he desired to come to us, to redeem us from the fallen, um, the fallenness and the, and the, <clears throat> the separation of sin. So in order to do that, God had to reclothe himself in a manner that could be tolerated by man. Now, you should, you should circle that in your notes because sometimes God will give you an assignment where in order for you to carry it out, you, you're going to have to empty yourself and be reclothed in a manner that the people that you're being sent to can handle. Okay, I'm going to just let that float in the air for a minute. You know, um... I used to work years ago, like back in the, oh, back in the late 80s, 1980s, when I lived in Florida, I worked as a child protective investigator. And um, when I got a, a call and I had to go um, investigate um, allegations of child abuse and neglect, um, I, I didn't go like my supervisor wanted me to go. like you know, in a suit and, you know, care flashing my investigator badge and all of that. No, usually I was in business casual, you know, dressed down because I oftentimes had to go in horrible conditions. Like I'd have to sit in the floor with kids, play with them, you know, um, you know, um, get behind their fear, get them to trust me so that, so that, um, they would talk to me you know, and, and tell me what I needed to know in order to investigate my case. And so I had to reclothe myself so that I could meet them where they were. And, and so God, God had to reclothe himself so that it could be tolerated by man. So he made himself of no reputation and took on him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Okay, now look, the phrase made himself of no reputation comes from the Greek word kainos. Okay, we looked at that earlier. Kainoo is a derivative of kainos, which means to make empty, to evacuate, to vacate, to deprive, to divest, or to relinquish. Because it was impossible for God to appear to man as God, he had to change his outward form. The only way he could make his limited appearance as a man was to willfully and deliberately and temporarily let go of all the attributes we usually think of when we consider the glory of God, okay? For 33 years on earth, Jesus divested himself of his heavenly glory and picked up instead the mantle, the form, the nature of a servant. So the phrase took upon him describes the marvelous moment when God reached out to lay hold of human flesh and clothe himself in it as an embryo in the womb of a young virgin girl. <laughs> you talk about, now that, that blows your mind right there. That's mind blowing. Okay. Now here's what you and I need to get. Here's what you and I need to get. It doesn't say that he made himself a bad reputation or that he made himself a questionable reputation, but simply no reputation. That is, he didn't come into earth when he came into the earth, you didn't hear bum ba da da bum 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 ba da da. Matter of fact, the announcement was made to shepherds in the field at night, not to the king to the king's palace. A poor peasant girl from Nazareth and her her a carpenter tradesman husband, you know, come on, born in a manger in Bethlehem. That's real prophetic because that's where the lambs that were used in temple sacrifice were raised. Okay, so that's another teaching. 
So it was appropriate that the Lamb of God would, would be born in Bethlehem where the lambs that were used in temple sacrifice because he would be our, our sacrifice. And so he made himself of no reputation. Reputation, image, prestige, prominence, position, status, rank, power, and all the other trappings of leadership. That's how we get ourselves in trouble. Wanting to be first, wanting to be in charge, wanting to control everything. That's how we get in trouble. That's not what Jesus did. He, he, and, and so not only were those trappings devalued, but they were dismissed. Reputation, it's cultivation, it's elevation and protection was of no importance to Jesus in his ministry. I'm gonna just let that linger in the air for a couple seconds. He became such a man, not by default or accident, but by divine intention and design. And it was only in this form that he could serve, love, give, teach, and yes, how could he deal with tax collectors and sinners and people caught in adultery and people with leprosy if he didn't empty himself and make himself of no reputation? See, we walk around a lot of times thinking we too good for certain things. That's not the nature of Christ. So here, let, let me let you listen in on the conversation as the Lord began to say this to me and I began to study it. Here's um, what, 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 you know, just what I was thinking in, in my heart, you know, I was like, Bernie, man, this is a challenge. You have to remember now I was in a place where I was feeling disrespected and dishonored. And if I shared with you what happened, you would probably agree. But God sees things from diff a different perspective. And it wasn't so much the, the incident as it was my response in the incident. Okay? Okay. So hold on to that. So I, I was telling myself, this is a big challenge. And most people, particularly leaders, but most people um, believe that the development of a good reputation or respect in life and in leadership is a part of living a holy sanctified life and it comes with hard work preparation and position it comes with the territory particularly in, in church depending on where you are we tend to think that depending on our titles that we we should we garner a certain weight of respect you know and come on you know that assumption is an insidious temptation it, there's an there's a insidious temptation that is hiding under that, and that is that reputation and pride are very closely linked. So much so that it is difficult for us to consider one without the other. When we are concerned about our reputation, or how could they do that to me? What how could you do that to me? Then what we what we're doing is we're we're giving excessive amount of attention to. Um, what people think about us, we're hypersensitive to criticism, we're on guard to protect any wrong notions or unfair judgments of our work and character, we're hypersensitive to what feels like disrespect and dishonor. And so here is a rather harsh conclusion, Bernardine, Bernardine, me, that I had to consider. Caring too much about your reputation as a leader is absolute bondage. It'll, it, 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 it'll stifle you, okay? You can spend the rest of your life running around trying to prop up your reputation, make sure that nobody mistreats you or disrespects you, you know, squashing any rumors or bad reports. Oh my God, we won't even talk about that. I've, I've had that happen so many times in my life and ministry, you know, trying to iron out what feels like disrespect. You cannot do that all the time, you know, and you definitely can't do it thinking that it has nothing to do with personal pride because it is connected to pride. And so that is the deception that underlies the idea of reputation. You know, in other words, we have to get to the point where nothing matters other than him in terms of what people think about us or, or what names they call us or how they treat us. What's, you know, that, that um, um, oh, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Come on now, we like to quote it, but we don't want to live it. Are you still out there? 
So following Jesus is an ongoing disciplined practice of becoming a person of no reputation, a person who knows how to empty themselves of pride veiled in privilege, pride veiled as privilege, emptying yourself of pride veiled as privilege, thinking that you ought to have certain things and you should be treated this way, pride veiled as privilege. And in this way, as we empty ourselves of that, we become more like Christ day by day. Henri Nouwen said that we have to resist the temptation to be relevant. <clears throat> Look at this. He said, I'm deeply convinced that the Christian leader, <coughs> excuse me, of the future is called to be completely irrelevant and to stand in this world with nothing to offer but his or her own vulnerable self. And over and over in the gospels, you'll see Jesus um, performing certain miracles and then disappearing, leaving, just making himself of no reputation. That is, you know, that um, uh, let God get the glory, you know, um, <clears throat> not drawing attention to himself. So I had to tell myself, Bernie, you cannot be the caretaker of your reputation, your honor, your status. When you are able to embrace this understanding, then chains will fall off your shoulders and the things that irritate and vex and frustrate your soul will lose their power because it will not be about you. It is all about him. When I become a do loss and I live from that place, then the stuff that irritated, vexed, frustrated me loses its power. Do, do you understand? So Christians are called to be obedient disciples of Jesus Christ, period. That's it, period. Oh, an obedient disciple of Jesus Christ, period. No glamour, you know, no uh, prestigious seats. <laughs> You know, now that being a, 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 an obedient disciple may bring you a good reputation or it may produce a bad reputation. I've served in places where being an obedient disciple brought me a bad reputation. You know, people didn't like the fact that I was doing what I was doing, particularly like with the church that I was planting and how it was growing and that type of thing. And a bad reputation for what? For preaching the gospel? Or you no reputation at all. You might do what you do and serve how you serve and be obedient to Christ. And it's hidden. Nobody even sees it. See? Um, so that may bring honor, dishonor, regard, disregard, respect, disrespect, consideration, inconsideration. <clears throat> it's up to God as to how he's going to have things manifest in your life. You just be of no reputation. Because it's not about you anyway. It is about him, I know we run around my church, my people, my this, and you have no nail prints, no nail prints in my hands. I, I'm, I'm supposed to serve. If I obediently follow him, loving him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, love my neighbor as myself, speak the truth in love, preach, teach, proclaim, demonstrate the coming kingdom of God <clears throat> with passion and without compromise, then my reputation should be of little consequence to me. Because what I should be concerned about, the Lord was trying to show me, is him serving him, being obedient to him. You know, so I have to ask, are you leading Bernie in a way that ensures the safekeeping of your own character or status or a reputation? Or are you willing to give it up completely in order to follow him regardless of the cost? Follow him regardless of what it costs me to follow him where he sends me, when he sends me, how he sends me. Am I willing to give my reputation of what I think I've earned up so that I can be obedient to him. Okay, let's go back to Philippians. So the word took upon him are from the Greek word lambano, which means to take, to seize, to catch, to latch, to clutch, clutch, to grasp. So this lets us know that God literally reached out from his eternal existence, reached into the world he had created, 
<clears throat> took upon him human flesh, not a superhero, not an icon or an idol. <clears throat> My throat is so dry today. Not any of the other titles or positions we like to give and call ourselves. No, he bypassed all of that. He bypassed all the prestige and he took upon himself what? The nature of a servant, a doulos servant, okay? Not a diakonos minister servant, but a doulos servant, slave. The word form in this phrase, morphe, of course, remember, being in the form, the nature. And so it, it means that just as Jesus in his pre-existence form had all the outward appearance of God, now in his human appearance, he has the exact form of man. So he lived in the earth exactly the same way as other men, walking in holiness with his father. So here is what I believe Holy Spirit wanted me to see. Okay, are you ready? And want you to see in this season, this will help you get through the rest of the year. <laughs> I'm trying to help you. Here's what he wants us to see. Definitely me. Okay, I own it. Okay. For a brief time in his eternal existence, Jesus emptied himself of the perks and benefits and status and position connected with his divinity and literally becomes a doulos man in every way. So listen to me, beloved. The Lord will lead you into some, oh boy, I felt, this, is, this, this sentence, I didn't get it out, but it's got oil on it. So let me tell you, here's what the Lord is saying. The Lord will lead us into some places and situations where we will have to empty ourselves of the perks and benefits, the status and position connected with who you by nature are. And instead, you will have to take upon yourself the form and the nature of a doulos. That's for every married person that's listening to me. You can't, even, you can't even walk in the covenant of marriage if you don't know how to empty yourself. Okay, let me keep going. So not only did God become man, but the Lord took upon him the form of a servant. This is the Greek word doulos, which refers to a love slave. A doulos was a person whose master had redeemed them, set them free. But because of the goodness and love of their master um, towards them and their love for their master, they say, I will serve you for the rest of my life. So they take that person, they drive a, a, a hole through their ear, put an earring in, and that earring represented that they were a doulos slave. Okay, voluntary love slave. I will serve you forever as my master. That's the, that's the posture Jesus took when he came into the earth. That's the example he tried to set for his disciples when they were arguing over who was going to be first, who was in charge. And he, you know, girded himself, took off his garment, girded himself and took a bowl and washed everybody's feet and said, you know, now what I have done, the example I just set, set, that's how I want you to live. We have so messed up stuff in the church. That's why, you know, the scripture tells those of us who teach and preach and are in a, that, you know, we have to be very careful because we're going to be judged with a, a stiffer judgment because of what we have done to the church. Thinking that it's all about us, our name, our title, our position, how I'm treated, you disrespected me, blah, 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 blah. You know, look, look at this. Or whatever your situation is, okay, could be on your job, 
could be um, could be between you and your neighbor. Um, could be you driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is. Come on, let's let's take on the 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 the, the let's empty ourselves. Let's let's be of no reputation. Okay, so look at this. Paul goes on to say that Jesus was made in the likeness of men. The phrase was made is the Greek word genomai, which means to become. So of course, that's just, that's again, another clue that man was not Jesus' original form. He became a man, just like our original form is sinner. But when we are genomai, when we are begotten of God, yeah. When we are begotten of God, we become born again. We take on the nature of our father in the inner man. You just need to let your flesh know it. So this is the miracle that occurred when God became a man. Jesus had always existed in the form of God, not the form of man. But when he took on him human flesh, he was formed in the womb of the Virgin Mary and became a man. Now, listen to me. What womb does God currently have you in where he is forming you into a doulos? What is the womb that you are in? I, I can name, I know the womb I'm in. What womb are you in? Maybe it's that job that you hate. <laughs> Maybe it's that situation that you're in, whatever it is. Could it be a womb in which God is forming you into his image? I'm just asking. So God literally took upon himself the likeness of man. The word likeness is the Greek word homoima, and it refers to a form or a resemblance. So this refers not only to Jesus being made in the visible likeness of men, but also in the human likeness of, of men. So that word likeness, not only was he physically a man, but he, he was human. He took on humanity. So if, if you cut him, he would bleed. He got tired. He, he was hungry. He got irritated. You know, yet without sin, he know what he knew how to handle stuff, what to do with it. See, that's why he had such a strong prayer life. And so, when Jesus appeared on this earth, he came in the actual form of a man and was like a man in every way. You have to get that. He was so completely made in the likeness of men that the scripture in Hebrews 4 and verse 15 says he was even tempted in every way that men are tempted yet without sin. So he showed us how to walk the walk, okay? So we have not a high priest that can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows what it's like to go through the things that, that you're going through. He knows what loss is like he knows what it's like for people to disrespect you or dis or disenfranchisement, all of that stuff. He understands all of that. He was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. And so God the Father sent the Son into the world. And when he did, Jesus left his heavenly home and took upon him the human flesh. Because of this great exchange, he stood in our place. He has felt what we felt. He he has been touched with the feeling of our infirmities and he intercedes with us because of that with great compassion as our high priest. And so his life on earth was just a brief appearance in his eternal existence. So out of his deep love for you and for me, he was willing to leave his majestic realms of glory to enter the realm of humanity. He shed all his visible attributes that were too much for our flesh to endure anyway. He could not have come in the glory of God. He had to dress himself in, um, uh, in, the, in human flesh. The man born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth was and is the eternal ever existent God Almighty who dressed himself in human flesh so that he could dwell among men and purchase our salvation. So what's your assignment? You know, what will you have to relinquish? What is God calling you to take off, to give up so that you can be clothed in something new? I'm going to say that again. 
What womb does he have you in? What is he forming in you? And what will you have to relinquish in order to be clothed in the new? Did you get that? Because to, 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 to be fully clothed in the new, you're going to have to take off something from the, the last season. Okay. When Paul started this text on God becoming a man, he started by saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so the Lord wants you and I to have the same mind or attitude that Jesus had. So just as Jesus was willing to go this incredible distance to reach us and to love us and to redeem us, we should desire to do the same thing for others. What are you willing to take off in order that you may be clothed in the new so that you can fulfill the assignment that God has given you? I'm telling you, be of no reputation. You're going to have to empty yourself of something in order to fit into the new. Everything that God is could not have fit in the, 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 the physical in time man. He had to empty, he had to take off the glory, the enormity of everything that God is and be clothed in a panoply of flesh. So listen, what would happen, what would happen in the church, in our homes, on our jobs, in our communities, if we were willing to divest ourselves of all of our titles and our status and position, our benefits and privileges, our resumes and the honor we think we've earned, and do whatever we can or whatever God is calling us to do in order to reach out and to help and to serve people. What would happen if we were willing to to um, can know all to to um, um, evacuate all of that to to empty ourselves of some stuff. What you mean? I lived this long and I came this far. Yes, yeah, so I could lay it down. Yes, this is what Jesus did for us. Shouldn't we do the same for others? Okay, let's let's read this and I'm done. Let's look at. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to look at it in the Passion Translation, and then I'm done, okay? Listen to it in the Passion Translation. If you don't have the notes, then just listen. This is Philippians 2. Look at how much encouragement you found in your relationship with the Anointed One. You are filled to overflowing with His comforting love. You have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit and have felt his tender affection and mercy. So I'm asking you, my friends, that you be joined together in perfect unity with one heart, one passion, and united in one love. Yeah, but they're Baptist and, and we're Pentecostal, or yeah, they're, they're Catholic and, and, and we're charismatic. Be joined together in perfect unity with one heart, one passion, and united in one love. Walk together with one harmonious purpose, and you will fill my heart with unbounded joy. Look at this, verse 3. Be free from pride-filled opinions, for they will only harm your cherished unity. Many a church split could have been avoided if we would just live in verse three. We haven't even gotten to verse six and seven. Be free from pride-filled opinions for they will only harm your cherished unity. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your hearts, but in authentic humility, put others first and view others as more important than yourselves. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. Oh my God, we, we are not there. 
But that's that's where God wants us to be. But we are not there. Okay. Look at this. And consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one, has set before us. Let his mindset become your motivation. He existed in the form of God, yet gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. He became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. He was a perfect example. Even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion, who would choose a criminal's death? But he emptied himself. And look at now, this is, this is the part that we have not really understood. Because of that obedience, because of him being made of no reputation, because of him emptying himself, because of him being a doulos servant, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the greatest of all names because he emptied himself, because he made himself of no reputation. So it is in that abasement that he is exalted. It's, it's in um, him humbling himself that he rises instead to prominent both. See, we got that backwards. We got it all screwed up in our human sinful minds. The authority of the name of Jesus causes every need to bow in reverence. Why? Because he emptied himself in, in, in obedience. Everything and everyone will one day submit to his name because he emptied himself and made himself of no reputation. See? And so will one day submit to his name in the heavenly realm, in the earthly realm, in the demonic realm, and every tongue will proclaim in every language, Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh, bringing glory and honor to his father. But that exaltation is the byproduct of humility. So true leadership, true, true discipleship is nurtured in the womb of humility. The power and the compassion and the authority um, is nurtured and cultivated in the womb of humility. So <clears throat> listen, that was the word of the Lord to me. I was ranting about um, something that had happened that if I were to share it, would go in your category labeled, oh, that was disrespectful. <laughs> <clears throat> but the Lord wanted me to know, regardless of what the other person did, here's your response in it. You be of no reputation. You walk like I walked. You empty yourself and be a doulos. And you leave the rest up to me. This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, guys. That's it. I'm out of word. I'm never out of word, but I'm done with that particular teaching. That is a word that will help you to get through this year. Remember that when you get in those tight places that learn how to empty yourself and be of no reputation and just be a servant, be like Christ. You can't, you know, and, and let me say this. Oh, I got a minute. It, it didn't mean that Jesus wasn't God because he is. It simply meant that he understood that he couldn't operate in the glory of that, in the, in the capacity that he had it in eternity past, we could not have, we couldn't have handled it. So there are assignments. Listen, people, the harvest is coming. Okay. All these people prophesying about untold numbers of people coming to harvest, the harvest, the harvest. Those people are going to come broke, 
busted, disgusted, addicted, angry, messed up. And the last thing they need is you and all your regal glory. We're going to have to learn how to empty ourselves and in humility, take broken people by the hand and walk them into an encounter with the living Christ for his glory and not our own. God bless you, beloved. I'm out of time. I will see you next week. Don't forget information regarding the Ancient Pathways Retreat is on my page. And if you want to be a blessing, maybe you can't go, but you'd like to give and sponsor somebody else to go, you can send an offering to um, Soterios Ministries Incorporated. Um, you can give at paypal.me forward slash Soterios Ministries or um, dollar sign um, Dr. Bernie SMI. That's Cash App, okay? God bless you, love you, and I'll see you next time. Take care.